Okay, folks, good afternoon. A uh, quick reminder uh, that last time we talked about spontaneous emission rate modification in a cavity and derivation of per cell factor. So we're now talking about the big coupling regime where coupling strength between the emitter um, and the field is lower than one of the loss rates of the system. And in particular, we're interested in the regime where the dominant rate is the cavity field decay rate, um, but still emitter is much narrower than, than the cavity. So it's a so, so-called good emitter regime, but weak coupling. And in that regime, we derived that enhancement of the spontaneous emission rate is described by the per cell factor, which is given here. So the maximum value depends on the ratio between the two factor and the mode volume. Um, and there were some questions regarding this uh, uh, with respect to homework on Piazza. Uh, mode volume is in units of meter cube, it's a volume, but normally uh, people express it um, as number of cubic wavelengths, right? So you can think of V divi being divided by lambda over n cube, which means that it's just a number of these cubic wavelengths that would fit inside of the volume. So, so the overall per cell factor is unitless, but this is because um, units for V and for lambda would cancel out. And uh, of course, the maximum value uh, is reached only when the emitter is on resonance with the cavity field spatially and spectrally. So spatially, you have to put it into the location of maximum electric field energy density, align the polarization of the dipole moment with the electric field polarization, and also spectrally, you uh, should align the, the emitter resonance new with the cavity resonance omega, and that's when you reach the maximum value of the per cell factor. So uh, although it's a weak coupling regime, although you cannot observe Rabi oscillation in this regime, it's still interesting because um, uh, localization of electromagnetic field inside of the resonator uh, makes emitter radiate fast. Okay, and likewise in the regime where you cut off the density of optical states, you can make the emitter radiate slower and we went through various experiments that, that describe that. Um, we primarily talked about solid state platform, you know, mostly quantum dot inside of the cavity for strong coupling regime, uh, also for weak coupling regime in Umarsenide quantum dots in gallium arsenide. We also talked about color centers in semiconductors, diamonds, silicon carbide last time. Um, these semiconductor platforms in optical regime are pretty interesting for experiments because they're small, integrated um, systems operate at very high frequencies, I mean very high speed. Uh, Rabi frequency can be in the range of, of uh, several gigahertz to tens of gigahertz for uh, quantum dot inside of the cavity because you have very small optical mode volumes. Um, there is no complicated atom trapping mechanism. Everything is at optical frequencies again. Uh, although you have integrated platform in circuit QED, you can directly emit uh, photons in the optical range and inter interface them to optical networks. Um, but um, we discussed some issues with um, the fact that these solid state emitters are not the same, they're influenced by the environment, so people have to tune them. And we talked about that fast tuning and fast modulation of the emitters that could also be used to modulate the signal and uh, start shifting using electrodes. And these systems also operate at cryogenic temperatures. Um, and on the other uh, hand, you know, most of the, especially for the first few decades of that cavity QED, people have done experiments pretty much exclusively on this atomic cavity QED platform, where you have a large resonator to polish the fabric, uh, polished mirrors forming fabric per resonator, and then you drop and trap atoms into this space between the mirrors and perform experiments. And of course, these are very large systems, separation between mirrors is hundreds of micrometers, uh, optical mode volume is large, and as a result of that, Rabi frequency would be pretty small, megahertz range, uh, right? Uh, and you also have to trap atom, you trap it for some amount of time, and that limits the, the duration of your experiment. So it's not very practical platform if you were to make some integrated system or modulator or something like that. But I wanted to mention that in recent years, people have been looking very actively also into miniaturizing this platform, not just in order to obtain integrated kind of more portable platform for atomic physics, but also because using smaller volume cavities would enhance the interaction between the atom and the cavity field because the Rabi frequency scales as one over square root of the mode volume. So here are some of the pictures from the recent experiments at Harvard and MIT looking in Vulicic group. I mean, there were even more recent experiments than that, but this was uh, one of probably still pretty much state of the art in terms of the coupling. Um, so they use, again, one-dimensional nanobeam photonic crystal cavities, and they trap atoms uh, into evanescent field 
of this mold uh, and then they see um, that when that happens in transmission of light through the cavity, they see spontaneous emission rate enhancement for the atom. So it's not yet very large cooperativity regime, it's not yet strong coupling regime, but they're getting there, right? And the idea is that by using a very small volume cavity like this one, as opposed to the traditional atomic uh, physics cavity, you can reduce mold volume by many orders of magnitude. And then this coupling strength for the same type of atom can go from megahertz range to gigahertz range. And if coupling strength is in gigahertz range, then Rabi frequency is in gigahertz range, you can switch the system much faster um, and you, know, you can actually build more practical uh, components for quantum information, for example. Uh, so that's, you know, on the kind of merging between atomic physics platform and solid state platform. And of course, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that there, there are a lot of beautiful experiments with circuit QED, which is all in the microwave range because you built your artificial atom using Josephson junctions, but physics of that is exactly the same. So we'll not really go into other uh, additional um, uh, types of micro resonators here because the topic of this class are optical micro cavities. But just as a side note that physics of those systems is pretty much the same as the physics of cavity QED systems we discussed here. It's the same Hamiltonian. Um, I mean, photons are microwave photons, but again, they're described by the same harmonic uh, oscillators or uh, Hamiltonians. And you know, you have to define the modes of the system, quantize field, look at the interaction and so on. So you, you, you people have observed exactly the same strong coupling experiments, photon blockade experiments, it's exactly the same, just microwave regime and, and different superconducting cavity. So, so today, you know, at least in the first half of the class, I wanted to uh, say a few words about interaction of uh, very large ensembles of quantum emitters in the cavity and how this weak coupling regime is interesting for some practical applications apart from, you know, uh, quantum information and single photon generation. And in particular, I wanted to talk about the connection between Purcell factor and lasing threshold. And then after the break, probably we'll move on to discussion of whispering gallery mode cavities. Uh, so what we'll do now is again, weak coupling regime. I mean, not strong coupling of an ensemble to, to a cavity, but instead uh, you have a lot of different quantum emitters that could, that could actually be ensemble of quantum dots or color centers or quantum wells and a lot of excitons in the quantum wells uh, or electron hole pairs in quantum wells that are coupled to some cavity field. And the system is in the weak coupling regime, which means that the cavity field decay rate again dominates. The cavity field decay rate is much larger than homogeneous line width of the individual emitter. But you, of course, you can have some inhomogeneous broadening here. And that's again the regime where you have per cell enhancement for all of these individual emitters. And we'll see how that can impact the lasing threshold. So, uh, some interesting practical applications of this are shown here. So we'll see how you can use this strong per cell enhancement in small resonators to reduce lasing thresholds. Um, that, that will be the topic of the first part of the class. But also, obviously, you can also make faster modulators by, by using this approach, because if you uh, build a system where you are changing refracting index by injecting carriers and you make those carriers recombine much faster uh, inside of a small cavity, then you can actually make higher speed modulator because you can, you can change it between different states much faster. Uh, but also at the same time, if you localize it inside of a small uh, volume and with moderate Q factor, you can make it operate at lower energies. In other words, localization of electromagnetic field inside of this resonator allows you to switch it with smaller energy and to switch it faster as a result of the Purcell enhancement. So we'll see some examples of this. Uh, and these are practical applications which um, in this particular case, you know, could be done at room temperature because we're not really anymore looking into strong coupling regime or any strong light matter interaction. We only need to have Purcell regime in order to achieve this. And that's of course achievable even at room temperature. And a lot of these emitters or quantum wells, of course, operate at room temperature. So, so the first thing that I'd like to say is the relation between uh, lasing threshold and spontaneous emission rate enhancement. And in order to explain that, I have to introduce something called spontaneous emission coupling factor or beta factor. And if you you know, buy a laser or you read a paper about any new type of laser, you'll probably see this 
beta factor quoted for the laser. And that uh, beta factor is basically telling you what fraction uh, of the total spontaneous emission from the system goes into one particular mode, which is the cavity mode. And this is not a laser class, and I'll write the simplest possible form of laser rate equations in a moment to show you how this beta factor influences lasing threshold. But all of you know that lasers are basically operating in the regime of stimulated emission. And in order to, to get to lasing, you have to first start from subthreshold regime, and then you increase the pump current or optical pump power in order to overcome the losses of the system and get to the lasing regime, right? And stimulated emission means that you have enough photons that could stimulate the emission of subsequent photons, but because the decay rate scales as a number of photons inside of the, the, the lasing mode. We'll see that in a moment. So one of the losses in the system would be spontaneous emission, obviously, because you have your quantum well, your quantum dots, you excite them into excited state, they decay down, emit photons, and those photons can go into any different mode, right? But only one specific mode would be lasing. It, you, you generally want one mode to laser, or there will be multiple modes, but one is the one that you want to lock your system to. So if you spontaneously, if you let your emitters get excited and spontaneously decay and photons go into a variety of modes, that's all loss in the system, unless photons went specifically into one mode of interest, which is a lasing mode. Right. So the more of those loss you have, the more you would have to pump the system to reach the lasing threshold. Right. And that kind of definition of beta factor is already telling you that if all of my spontaneous emission goes into the lasing mode, then it's good. Then lasing threshold would be the smallest possible because I have minimal amount of loss. But in reality, you know, for, you know, vertical cavity surface emitting lasers like pixels or, you know, unless you're working with some, some very nano lasers that we'll discuss today, the spontaneous emission coupling factor is generally on the order of 1% or lower, which means that you have very large loss, right? 99% of your spontaneously emitted photons would go into, into other modes, and that means that pump threshold has, uh, threshold uh, pump power has to be large. So anyway, beta factor is essentially uh, related to spontaneous emission and tells you what fraction of spontaneous emission goes into one specific cavity mode, lasing mode, that will become lasing mode relative to the total spontaneous emission rate. And here I just wrote that the total spontaneous emission uh, uh, rate is the emission into that cavity mode, lasing mode, plus all the other modes, okay? And, you know, all the if you pump really hard, whatever, even bulk material, you can make it lace, although sometimes you may destroy it before you get it to lace. Cavity helps because cavity collects all of the photons that are spontaneously emitted. Uh, so they stay near the emitters and they can easier stimulate the emission of subsequent photons, which is why, you know, pretty much all the lasers have laser cavities, right? And otherwise, it, it, you destroy material before you get it to lace. Okay, so spontaneous emission coupling fa factor. So this is different from spontaneous emission rate enhancement, which is per cell factor. This is spontaneous emission coupling factor. And this is the ratio of spontaneous emission that goes into the cavity mode, which will be lasing mode relative to the total spontaneous emission rate. So we discussed per cell factor, right? And we know that if the system is in the weak coupling regime, in the per cell regime, then this spontaneous emission rate in the cavity can be enhanced relative to the free space spontaneous emission rate by a factor which we call per cell factor, right? So what I wrote here is that spontaneous emission rate in the cavity, gamma cavity, is in, and that's into a specific mode. Keep in mind that that's not like the total spontaneous emission rate. That's just into the late mode that I call lazing mode or cavity mode of interest. So that rate is per cell factor times the bulk spontaneous emission rate. And let's assume for a moment that this spontaneous emission rate into other modes is not enhanced, right? So how do I achieve that? Well, I can achieve that by, you know, picking the small uh, mode volume, high Q factor mode for the lazing mode and enhancing spontaneous emission rate into that mode, right? By some factor F. But other modes, like free space modes, are not modified. Although we'll see examples where those free space modes could be suppressed and that can help in the, in the process. Could, so, could you like, uh, say, yeah. say something that 
some little words about why uh, the per sale factor can be put in the first equation? Why can it be put in the first equation? I am not doing anything other than writing that spontaneous emission rate of emitters in the cavity is enhanced by some factor, which I call per cell factor. That's not always the case. You know, if you have something like a very large cavity, just two mirrors and large volume, there will be no really significant per cell enhancement. But let's say you have photonic crystal cavity or even micropillar cavity, which has pretty good ratio of quality factor to mode volume, then spontaneous emission rate there will be enhanced by some factor F, okay? And even if it's not enhanced, you just say F is one, right? Per cell factor is one, it's the same as the bulk material. But I, I'm trying to, I'm just writing that it's um, uh, enhanced by a factor of F, right? And we'll see how that would impact spontaneous emission coupling factor. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you have active material like quantum well, right? You buy a vapor containing quantum wells, indium, gallium, arsenide, phosphate, quantum wells from a company, and you measure spontaneous emission rate. And let's say spontaneous emission rate from, from that is about 600 picoseconds. Then you make a resonator in that material, and you'll see that the same quantum emitters, which are like a whole pairs from your quantum well, can decay maybe with a sub 100 picosecond rate as a result of high Q factor to load volume of that cavity, right? Not non-radiative decay. So I'm just saying, you know, in my system, I can have spontaneous transmission rate enhanced by some factor of F, but if the resonator is big or it's not doing much, then maybe F is one. It still holds, this expression still holds. Okay, so if I just write that spontaneous transmission rate into the cavity mode is basically equal to free space spontaneous transmission rate times some factor F, which is basically per cell factor. And I write that spontaneous emission rate into other modes. All other modes is pretty much free space spontaneous emission rate. It's not modified, right? You just took one mode and enhanced. Then you plug that back into this expression and you can write that this is basically F divided by one plus F, okay? So what is this telling us? If you, as you, I mean, do you want to Operate system to operate in the Purcell regime to to increase the beta factor. Yeah, the larger the the larger you make f, right? The closer beta gets to one. Does that make sense? Right. So so spontaneous emission, picking up one specific mode and enhancing spontaneous emission rate into that mode means that you will primarily redirect all of the spontaneous emission rate into that mode. Right? You will make all of your carriers that you generate electron hole pairs inside of the medium decay and emit photons into one specific mode of interest. So beta will be approaching one, which means that the loss, which is spontaneous emission into radar modes will be, will be suppressed. And that's good because there will be no loss to overcome in order to reach lasing threshold. Does that make sense? Why the gamma to other lossy channel will be equivalent to spontaneous? This is, this is approximation that you are completely right. It's not necessarily equal. And there will be example when gamma other will be suppressed. For example, if you take photonic crystal cavity, right? In photonic crystal cavity, you have one mode and, and we'll just look at the examples of that where you have strong per cell enhancement. So that's gamma cavity, which is F times gamma naught. But spontaneous emission rate into other modes is actually suppressed. Last time I showed you that spontaneous emission rate when you are off the cavity resonance is suppressed to some by a factor of five to 10, right? So gamma other in that case would be one tenth of gamma naught, okay? But in vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, for example, pixels that you have in, in cell phones that you can buy for a few hundred dollars, for example, it turns out that there are a lot of different modes and spontaneous emission rate into other modes is pretty much more or less like free space spontaneous emission rate, but you can have maybe a little bit of the enhancement into one mode or that is on the order of one or so, okay? So this is just approximate expression that is telling you, I mean, if you wanna find it exactly, you have to do much more accurate calculations, but this is just telling you that the trend is the following. The larger the per cell enhancement into specific mode, the larger the beta factor and maximum value that it can have is one, okay? 
when all of the spontaneous emission goes into one mode. So now talking about blazing threshold, I'll just write a very, very simple uh, laser rate equations for, for uh, a system. Uh, and we'll just use that to show how beta influences blazing threshold. Right. And uh, this is different from the way you'll see laser rate equations written in laser classes, because I will write them in terms of the total number of photons in the cavity mode, which is P, right? So I will not really write photon density, which is typically used in, in laser rate equations. And I will also write it in terms of the total number of excited carriers in the system, right? So not carrier density. I mean, it's the same equations. You can normalize P by optical volume, and you can normalize number of excited carriers by active volume. Uh, and also, if you're writing laser rate equations and studying laser dynamics or threshold, you also have to look into the uh, excitation level in the system from which carriers decay into the excited state. We're not doing that. We'll just write very simple rate equations for the excited state, carriers in the excited state, and number of photons in the cavity mode. So it's a very simplest form that you can have with a lot of approximations, but we're just doing that to see the effect of beta factor on trash. So if you have the system consisting of a lot of carriers, you know, that you can excite, bring to excited state, um, and from there they, they can decay, let's first write the equation that describes the number of excited carriers that you have in the system, right? So the number of excited carriers changing the number of excited carriers as a function of time is given here. So you are increasing the number of excited carriers by increasing the pump power. And this R pump would be in units of one per second, which is telling you how many carriers in the system you bring to excited state per, as a, per unit of time, right? So in order to get the actual pump power, you will have to multiply that by um, energy of a photon if you're doing optical pumping, for example, but this is just telling you how many of these kind of electrons you bring to conduction band or, or excited state per unit of time, right? Because we, we just need to keep the units correct. So the number of excited carriers per function of time increases with this pump, pump power, but it decreases as a function of the various decay routes in the system. And decay, decay mechanisms are decay, spontaneous emission decay into other modes, not the cavity or lasing mode, right? So this is just n times gamma other, right? And you have to multiply it by total number of carriers because each one of them decay with the same rate. You can have them decay into the cavity mode and into the cavity mode, the decay would be n times gamma ca cavity, which can be per cell enhanced, times P plus one. And this P is actually a number of photons in the cavity mode. So if you had only spontaneous emission into the cavity mode, how would this term be different? In spontaneous emission regime, P, there would be not there, right? Because it would be just an n times gamma cavity, like for other modes. But when you have stimulated emission, decay rate increases as a function of the number of photons in a specific mode, okay? And that's why you have this actual P here, right? So the P times N times gamma cavity would be stimulated emission and that spontaneous emission term is there. And in the course reader and in the lecture notes, I'll also post uh, additional slides on the stimulated emission if you haven't seen that, but this is typically covered in applied quantum mechanics classes, for example. So if you are interested in learning more, we can go through that, but stimulated emission is the same um, expression as a spontaneous emission, except that it's telling you that when you have certain number of photons in a specific mode, they can stimulate the emission of subsequent photons. And they stimulate it by making the emitters decay uh, with a rate which is uh, larger than the spontaneous emission rate by a factor which is proportional to the number, actual number of photons in a specific mode. And keep in mind that they have to be in the specific mode. If these photons are in a different mode, they wouldn't stimulate the emission, right? And when you go through derivation of the rate, they, the, all of these photons have to be really acted upon with the same annihilation and creation operators, or you will not see these enhancement pop up. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is stimulated emission into the cavity mode plus spontaneous emission. And the last term is non-radiative decay. 
right? And there may be non-radiative decay into various mechanisms, although for simplicity, we will neglect this today. I mean, there is always non-radiative decay, but we can neglect it. So does this equation make sense? Uh, could you like explain again? Yeah, so, so we have this, so when you write laser rate equations, you write basically two equations always. And sometimes you write additional equations for the levels through which you are pumping the system. But two key equations of, that we call laser rate equations are the equation for the carrier density and for the photon density, okay? So here I'm writing it a little differently because I'm not writing in terms of densities, but actual number of photons in the cavity mode and the actual number of excited carriers, which is N here. So when you build a laser, right, you would take some active medium, maybe quantum wells, and you have to pump it by passing current or pump it with another laser or a flashlight to bring carriers into the excited state. And from there, those carriers decay, emit photons, and some of them go into the mode that will become a lazy mode, right? So that number of carriers that are ex in the excited state as a function of time uh, changes as shown in this equation. To bring, to increase the number of excited carriers, I have to pump the system, and that's our pump. Okay, and this R pump depends on how hard I'm pumping it with a flashlight or current or another laser. The stronger I pump it, the more of these carriers would go into excited state per unit of time. And this is of course proportional to pump power. But these excited carriers decay from the excited state by spontaneous emission into other modes, by spontaneous emission, stimulated emission into the cavity, lasing mode, and some non-radiative processes. And those are the three terms with the minus sign. So dn per dt increases with R pump, but decreases as these three terms. Does that make sense? And if you look at the traditional form of laser rate equations, you'll recognize all of these terms, except that instead of R pump, there'll be R pump some pump power plus some, some factors that, you know, let's say pump power divided by energy of a photon, which is the same as our pump, depending on how you write it. And then N, since it's basically carrier density, it would be normalized relative to the active volume. So there will be some extra terms that pop up here, but you'll see all of these terms technically be there. Okay. So that's one equation. And we need another equation, which is for total number of photons in the cavity mode, right? So that's the same as this P here. This is a stimulated emission term, right? So the, when you have photons already present in the cavity mode and you have your excited carrier, which would emit and spontaneously decay into that cavity mode with the rate gamma cavity, the presence of these photons in that mode would stimulate it to decay faster. And it would decay faster by a rate proportional to the number of photons. That's stimulated emission, okay? So that's this term here. But we want to write also equation for P. Right, and that equation would be the other rate equation. So the number of photons in the cavity mode increases by emission from these excited emitters into the cavity mode, which is the same as the, this term here in the previous equation. So you have spontaneous and stimulated emission, but it decreases as a function of loss. And loss is described with this cavity field decay rate, which is a combination of radiative and non-radiative loss. And since here where I'm writing a total number of photons, then instead of cavity field decay rate, I have to write energy decay rate, which is two kappa times the number of photons. Okay, so let's put that together and then we can discuss if you need more, more help. So here are the laser rate equations. The first one describes number of excited carriers. The second one describes number of photons in the cavity mode. Okay, any questions about this? Any questions about any terms here, right? So in, they both have loss, they both have terms that help them increase and the terms that help them decrease. And they're coupled because you see that you have this um, N in the second equation and you also have P in the first equation. They're coupled by physics of the system. Does that make sense? So you can use these rates equations to look at the dynamics of the laser, right? You can solve it as a n and p as a function of time, right? And people do that sometimes when they're interested in looking at the modulation rate of a laser, for example. But 
Uh, in steady state, when you solve it, and steady state means that you solve it when dn per dt and dp per dt are zero, that's what you do to find threshold, right? So that's a steady state behavior. And we will do that to find the threshold of the system, right? So in a steady state, dn per dt and dp per dt are zero, means you reach the condition where the number of excited carriers is not changing and number of photons in the cavity is not changing, okay? And there are many different ways of establishing a steady state because obviously the steady state can, can be described with certain combination of N and P, but only we will be looking into steady state equations or the condition on threshold when you are barely exceeding the loss of the system. So in steady state, both of these are equal to zero. You can express N from the second equation, plug it into the first equation, uh, and then first equation would only depend on P. And then from the first equation, you can express the pump power as a function of P, right? So, and, that, and you would obtain the expression that we have here, which is not surprising. I mean, what, what, when you look at this equation, what, what can you say? I mean, it depends on kappa, which is cavity field decay rate, spontaneous emission rate into the cavity, spontaneous emission rate into other things. It depends on P, which is the photon number, right? But when you look at this, what is it telling you? Our pump is the pump power, right? Or pump rate. What conclusions can you make on our day, on, on our day intuitively? Okay, clear. If the cavity is very lossy, then it'll take more energy to pump it to laze. That, that's completely true, right? So if cavity is very lossy, cavity field decay rate is small, so you have to pump more, right? Anything else? Pump rate depends on the photon number, right? So if you want to reach some larger photon number, you have to pump more, right? Is that true, right? So that's all completely true. And we can also rewrite it in a little different form where we can also see how it depends on the beta factor, right? So if I, you remember that beta factor was spontaneous emission rate into cavity divided by gamma cavity plus gamma other, right? So if you look at this expression, you can write that one over beta minus one is gamma other divided by gamma cavity. Okay, and then here in the first expression, you also have gamma other divided by gamma cavity. I can divide both of these terms by, by gamma cavity. So I'll have gamma other by gamma cavity and the second one would be canceled. So when I combine these two, I can write that R pump I mean, I can eliminate all these spontaneous emission rates and write R pump only in terms of kappa, P, and beta. Okay? So when you look at this, what is this telling you? It depends on beta as one over beta, right? So greater beta, if you, have, if you increase beta, pump rate should also decrease for a given photon number. But what is a threshold, right? I mean, this is in general pump rate that you, you need for a specific photon number. But the question is, how would you define lasing threshold, right? Because the more you pump, the more it would laze, right? And those of you who use lasers in the lab, you know, you reach the threshold and you, then you can crank, keep cranking up power above threshold until you run into some thermal instabilities and, and other issues, right? But power would increase at the output as a function of the input power because you change the slope, right? But you are still in the regime when you can keep increasing the output power. But what is happening on the lasing threshold? On the lasing thrush threshold, you're barely overcoming the loss, right? So your gain is equal to the loss, meaning that you are barely overcoming the loss of spontaneous emission into other modes to start the stimulated emission in the system. And in traditional laser rate equations, that's how you would find threshold. But the other way to, to find the threshold is, I mean, when we write it in this particular form, is by remembering that P is the total number of photons in the system, okay? in the cavity mode, not in the system, but in a specific cavity mode. So if you are interested in looking in the stimulated emission regime, what does P have to be equal to? What's the minimum value that P has to have in order to see stimulated emission? Ballpark figure, right? Does it have to be 100? What's the minimum number of photons in the cavity mode that you need to have to store in order to stimulate the emission of subsequent photons? One, right? 
you need at least one photon, right? You start, something should start happening around one, right? Zero is not enough, right? 100 is probably too much. But if you have one photon, it will stimulate the emission of subsequent photons. It will enhance the spontaneous emission by a factor of one plus one, right? Which is two. So you're starting to see decay rate change, right? And then if you have three photons, it's even faster decay rate change, right? So you, if P is one, that's when you are starting to see changes in the, in the behavior of the system and that's the threshold of the system. And this is how you know, people define lasing threshold quantum mechanically in quantum optics textbooks, that you need at least one photon in the system in order to see stimulated emission. And lasing threshold is defined as the regime when P is equal to one. If P is greater than one, you have more than one photon, you are already in the regime of stimulated emission. And again, I said this is a ballpark figure, whether it's on average one, because this is an average number of photons in the cavity, 1.1 or 0.9 or you know, 1.3, it doesn't really matter. And when you're looking at laser characteristics, there is this soft transition, right? So we decide that it's one, but you know, technically people extract, if I could just go back to this, you see it's a soft transition, right? So when you calculate, P, it's around one somewhere here. Whether it's 1.1 or 0.9 actually doesn't really matter. It's an average photon number. It's somewhere around there. And you can actually also prove that this is pretty much the same as classical definition of gain equal to loss. If you're interested, I can give you references that prove that. So, you know, going back to our lasing threshold, uh, that which is defined as P equal to one, if you go back to our expression for pump power is a function of P photon number, and you plug in P equal to one, that will give you pump power on threshold. You know, this expression gives you pump power for any given P number of photons in the cavity mode, but on threshold P is one, right? So if you plug in P equal to one, that gives you this, right? Which is how far, how hard you have to pump to reach threshold given certain cavity Q factor, cavity field decay rate, and given certain beta factor, okay? And as Jason was already saying, if you have a higher Q factor, pump rate would be lower. Does that make sense intuitively? Because it's easier to accumulate photons that would stimulate the emission of subsequent photons if your mirrors are good, right? You're not losing photons as much. So that makes sense. And the other thing that you see is that the other factor is one plus one over beta. So the larger the beta, the smaller the pump rate, okay? because it's beta plus one divided by beta, which is one plus one over beta. And you know, keep in mind in like pixels, it's less than 1%. So that factor can be pretty large, pretty large increase relative to, to our pump if beta was equal to one. So does that make sense? If your beta factor is small, that means that most of your spontaneous emission goes into modes other than the cavity mode. And that's a very large loss that you have to overcome in order to reach the lasing threshold. If all of your spontaneous emission goes into the cavity mode or lasing mode, then you have less loss to overcome to reach lasing threshold, which means that your pump rate on lasing threshold would be smaller. Does that make sense? And again, in traditional lasers, beta is very small. It's 1%, right, or smaller, which means that when you write this one plus one over beta, that would be on the order of 100 or, or larger for pixels, for instance which means that you, know, you can approximate this whole thing as omega divided by two Q beta, okay? So the way to reduce the lasing threshold is to increase the Q factor, increase the beta factor. Of course, you don't want to increase Q factor to infinity or to a very large values. Why, why do you think that would not be desirable? why wouldn't, would I not want to have Q go to infinity to reduce lasing threshold? Do you lose um, like how broadband the laser would be? It would affect definitely line width, right? Because lasing line width is, depends on Q, one over Q factor, right? But there is another actually kind of like more, uh, uh, another problem, which is that the larger the Q, I mean, first, it's, you are getting less light out, right? So, which is what you would like to have out of the laser. When it goes to infinity, nothing is getting out, right? And the other thing is that the rate with which you can turn the laser on and off or modulate 
then it would be slower, right? And in most of the modern lasers, you want to turn them on and off, right? For communications or some other applications. So of course, you know, they're still for, for lab applications, continuous wave lasers or very low line width, narrow line width, which operate with very high two factor cavities. But for, you know, semiconductor lasers for vexels that you use for communications, you actually don't want to, to increase Q too much because that means you wouldn't be able to modulate it fast and you wouldn't be getting photons out. Um, from the equation, how can we see the speed will be dropped? You don't really see that from this equation. You will see it if you are actually writing the, uh, you have to solve the laser rate equations in the dynamic regime, right? To obtain modulation rate. This is just steady state regime from which you don't really see modulation. But you can see it from our discussion of the physics. I mean, there are different ways of modulating the system. There is a large signal modulation and small signal modulation. Large signal modulation means that you completely turn laser on and off. Okay, so if you completely turn it off and then you turn it on, that means that you have to again go pass through the threshold and go from through spontaneous emission and stimulated emission regime. If you are um, operating in that large signal modulation regime, that you know that in spontaneous emission regime, but also in stimulated emission regime, decay of your carriers is proportional to spontaneous emission rate. In stimulated emission, you just multiply it by the number of carriers which is telling you that you have to basically decay, make them decay faster in order to switch the system faster, right? They have to recombine before you re-excite carriers again. Does that make sense, right? Because the optical signal that you're getting at the output comes from the fact that you're pushing your carriers into excited state, they decay, and then you're exciting them there again. And that decay mechanism depends on decay rate of the system, spontaneous emission rate and then stimulated emission rate, which is spontaneous emission rate times the number of photons. But there are other also things that, I mean, the shape of your signal, like the output depends on the cavity Q factor, kind of cavity ring downtime and so on. So you have to really solve it in the dynamic regime completely to see how, how it varies as a function of Q. And, and the first story that I was telling you are about how fast they recombine, of course, the spontaneous emission rate or the decay time from the excited state depends on F times the spontaneous emission rate, where F is the Purcell factor that depends on the Q factor to mode volume, right? So if you, if you enhance the spontaneous emission rate, then you will have it decay faster. Up to a certain point where you, you know, cannot really extract these very short photons from the system because your, your mirrors are too good, right? Because the shape of the photons in the output is also shaped by the, the whole resonator and mirrors. Again, you would have to solve the whole thing in the dynamic regime in order to see, you know, dynamics of all of this, but it is an interplay of spontaneous emission rate, cavity Q factor, and, and uh, uh, other effects in the system. And since you can increase since it's desirable to increase the spontaneous emission rate in order to reduce the lasing threshold, right? You can do that by increasing the Q factor or reducing the mode volume. By increasing Q factor is making system slower. You preferably want to reduce the mode volume as we'll see in a moment. There is another regime of modulation, which is a small signal modulation. And small signal modulation means that you just bias it somewhere above threshold and modulate it a little bit around that point to send you know, bits, zeros and ones. And in that regime, it turns out that the speed with which you can modulate the system depends on the photon density, which is the photon number divided by the mole volume, right? But you know that's not kind of intuitively obvious from, from the equations, okay? So now, you know, going back to what we derived, which was the steady state equations, pump rate depends on omega over two Q beta. So this is just a steady state, right? We're not talking about the dynamics of the system. And if you plot that from uh, this expression for various other parameters in the system, spontaneous emission rate, non-radiative decay, and so on, you will see curves that look like this. So this is a photon number as a function of injection current. And this is a log log plot, which is why it doesn't look the same as the curve I showed you before, but this, kink that appears in the curve here would be lasing threshold. And 
here, you know, there are additional parameters that were not neglected from the laser rate equations that are included here. But the point is that as beta increases, you're moving to the left, meaning that your lasing threshold decreases. And that's intuitively clear because all your spontaneous emission rate is going to a specific mode and you have less loss to overcome. There is always some loss to overcome, maybe non-radiative decay or so on. Ideally, if beta is equal to one, you know, we can build something that people call thresholdless laser. And it's not really, um, I mean, there is a lot of debate about the name thresholdless laser. There is always a threshold in the laser, right? Because when you look at the laser rate equations, you always need to overcome certain pump power in order for your photon number in the system to be one so that it can stimulate the emission of subsequent photons, right? So there is always a threshold. But the point is in the threshold-less laser, there is no loss into anything. Everything goes into the cavity mode, right? But there is still a regime where it's primarily spontaneous emission and the regime where you have a stimulated emission, although that's pushed to the origin as, as much as possible. Okay. And by the way, why would you like to have a lower lasing threshold? I mean, maybe we didn't answer the fundamental question that we're discussing here. Why would, why would you prefer to have a lower lasing threshold? Uh, less heat generation? Yeah, less heat to the generation. You know, you have to, I mean, we have uh, pixels here, right? And that means that if they have 1% uh, of the beta factor, their thresholds are typically in the order of milliwatts, right? So you have to put pump them with milliwatts of power in order to make them lace. Everything else, I mean, uh, if they were, you know, perfectly efficient lasers with beta factor of one, that would impact also your battery life, right? Because you never want to lose your energy to some loss mechanisms that are not really, you know, used for, for whatever practical purpose you have, right? So basically lower threshold means higher efficiency, right? Be it everything goes into a specific mode and, you know, you have to replace or charge battery less. Okay, great. And, uh, um, you know, uh, people have been looking into this. That's been motivation also for, for inventing and developing new types of cavities. We said that to reduce lasing threshold, you have to increase beta factor, right? To increase beta factor, you have to increase per cell factor. To increase per cell factor, you have to increase Q factor to mode volume ratio, okay? Uh, but increasing Q too much would not really work as well in the dynamic regime because very high Q factor would limit the decay time of photons from the cavity and would make the system slower. So we don't want to really operate in that regime, meaning that ideally you want to be in the regime where you have still good Q, but small mod volume. So per cell factor is large and system is fast. Okay. And people have looked into a variety of cavities. There was a lot of work on nanometallic cavities also. Nanometallic cavities can have very small mode volume. They're not diffraction limited, but they also operate in the regime of low Q, right? So that, that Q factor is primarily limited by absorption loss in the metal. So they have other, other types of loss, but in principle, Q over V is small, which means that you can also reach lower lysing thresholds. And people have looked into nanowire lasers or metal and metal clad nano pillars and, and other types of structures. Um, a lot of effort in the past has been on the micro disc cavities, micro pillars with DBR reflectors. This is the same as the Vexels configurations. This is basically what, what is the basis for most of communications and also what is in cell phones and so on. Uh, but they generally have larger diameters than the ones that are drawn here, right? They, they are not really very as small mode volume, which is why they have beta factors that are less than percent. And then photonic crystal cavities, they are kind of at a sweet spot in terms of Q over V because they can have high Q factor, but they can have very small mod volume and they can reach very low thresholds. So the record low lasing thresholds have been achieved with photonic crystal cavities for that specific reason. But they're harder to integrate. I mean, they're not surface emitting as these pixels. So if you actually want to have your laser for um, your facial scan, in order to access your phone instead of the password, you have you want something that actually efficiently radiates outside of the plane of the chip. So photonic crystal cavity would not really be a good choice for that. 
So um, I'll just show you some some kind of um, you know results and still record values on low, low threshold uh, from these types of photonic crystal laser. And the, both all of these have been achieved with quantum dots in photonic crystal cavities. Same platform as the one that you look for for uh, cavity QED, but with a large ensemble of quantum dots operating at longer wavelength and at room temperature. So that this result, um, for example, uh, where it is from is from UC Santa Barbara, um, Evelyn Hu and Pierre Petro. She was she was there at that time. Um, uh, she's now at Harvard. So her group measured beta factor of 0.85, 85% for this type of cavity. It was optically pumped with another laser, right? Which is not the practical configuration, but when you're developing new laser, you don't work on P-injunction injunction and electrical injunction un until you prove that it's lazing and working. And here you see on log-log curve how optical output depends on the input, and you also see a fit of the experimental data to you know simulations from laser rate equations, and from that they can extract the beta factor, which is 85%. If beta factor was 10%, you see how further away the threshold would be, much larger, right? Kind of more than an order of magnitude, right? So you are getting very low threshold, which for them is 124 nanowatts, right? Uh, as a result of this high Q factor and good Q factor and small load volume. I think Q factor is not ultra high. It's here maybe on the order of few thousand or 10,000. And just for comparison, in pixels, thresholds are typically on the order of milliwatt, maybe hundreds of microwatts to a milliwatts. And this is 100 nanowatts, right? So way, way small. And then also uh, there has been um, demonstrations of electrical injection of these structures. So this one is from, from Stanford, usually from my, my group a while back, where we incorporated PN junction on top of this photonic crystal cavity. Um, of course, that's what you need in order to make a practical laser. So you don't generate carriers with another flashlight or pump or another laser, but you inject it by putting a battery or drawing flowing current through this. And in order to, that, you to do that, you have to inject carriers efficiently into the cavity region. And we did that by doing this lateral P injunction that was aligned relative to the cavity. And we saw 180 nanoamps total lasing threshold, which actually there was some leakage through the substrate. So total threshold was around 60 nanoamps in this particular case. So it's much, much smaller than, again, for by a, about four to five orders of magnitude than vertical cavity surface emitting lasers before, for the same active medium before it gets to the lasing regime. And also operating in this regime allows you to modulate the system faster, turn it on and off faster for, um, to build a modulator. Um, depending on the application, I mean, if you were talking about the long distance communications, you need the laser because you need a lot of power. But if you're talking about optical interconnects, then you can also operate it in sub-threshold regime as a single mode LED. And there, the decay depends on the spontaneous emission rate. And since spontaneous emission rate is enhanced by per cell factor, just driving electrically this in the sub-threshold regime allows you to operate at 30 gigahertz with point 25 femtojoules per bit. So you don't need a lot of energy to, to generate carriers and generate photons, and you can turn it on and off fast. Um, and that's the bottom line here, because if you use, for example, vertical cavity surface emitting lasers where decay is a nanosecond, for example, you could only modulate it at about a gigahertz. Okay, But if you have parcel enhanced decay, then you can operate it at 30 gigahertz or more, because carriers decay much faster. And that's related to question that Yishu asked a few minutes ago. Okay, so you excite carriers; they decay faster. You can excite them sooner, right? Okay. So um, before we make a brief break, I just wanted to say that, and I posted these slides. Um, I uh, don't plan to go through this in this class because it would be yet another way of deriving for cell enhancement and strong versus weak coupling regime. We already discussed this briefly uh, that you know if you want to solve the system completely you can't use James Cummings Hamiltonian which doesn't have loss at all but you have to add additional terms to the system which would describe decay of your cavity field into other channels decay of your atom into other modes and solve the full Hamiltonian right and you know of course all of these terms are similar to the terms that you already have in James Cummings Hamiltonian but just solving it with additional uh, 
harmonic oscillators with additional interaction terms is harder. And I also solve it in course reader and in the lecture notes in the regime, decoupling regime, where you have to include additional modes that your cavity mode is coupled to, but you, at the end of the day, on, obtain the same result. The decay rate is 2G squared over kappa, which is per cell enhanced decay rate. So uh, I, since this quarter is shorter, I decided not to go through that and spend time, more time uh, talking about different types of cavities. And then with Raul, we'll also go into design of cavities and um, kind of numerical methods for analyzing cavities at the very end of the quarter. But if you are interested, you can actually read these notes that are online and in the course reader and see how actually you obtain exactly the same result at the end, which is the spontaneous emission decay into the cavity mode. And that's exactly the result that we have. And from this model, you can also see kind of the transition between strong and weak coupling, how you are damping strong coupling with the cavity field decay rate, which is, which is what we already know. Anyway, the result is the same as in the semi-classical regime where you find it for lossless system and then plug in the decay rates for the atom and the cavity and see from that what happens. Um, but this is for those of you who are interested in, in having uh, accurate derivation and proving kind of more rigorously that indeed this, this is happening instead of just plugging in the decay rates of the system. Okay, so, you know, this is the example again that, that was solved is the decay of the two level system in the presence of the cavity loss. And, you know, result is something that you already know. If there was no cavity loss, it's a vacuum Rabi oscillation, one plus cosine 2 g t over 2 when there is cavity loss it's damped and when then when you go to a regime where it's weakly coupled it's just e to the minus 2 g squared over kappa t which is spontaneous emission rate decay right which is what we have here okay so we'll make a few minutes break and then i'll start talking about whispering gallery resonators that this is this part will not be derived but of course you are very welcome to, re to read it <laughs> 
Oh, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, it's just for clarification. Maybe I missed it, but sure, yeah. um, when we are doing the lazing threshold, um, was it because yeah. of the simplifications oh, yeah. that we made that we could um, use a two-level system? Yeah, we are just. I mean, there is an additional level through which you are pumping the system, of course, uh, but we are not really writing equations for that level, right? I just describe whatever effect of that level is through our pump, which is telling you how many carriers you're bringing into the excited state from which the system decays. But you are right that you need, of course, another level in order to pump the system and, uh, and, and achieve LASIK. So, okay. But, yeah, so there is, the, I mean, when you write also traditional laser rate equations, these equations that you wrote are, are already there. I'm just not really describing what is going on with that extra level in these equations. I'm just writing the effect of that extra level through our pump. Okay, so it was all included. In yes, it is, it is included because the R pump is the num number of excited of carriers you're bringing to excited state and you are bringing them with another level, right? Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. I think we can keep going, right? So, um, the plan is just to start in the next 15 minutes talking about the uh, different types of resonators, which is what we'll spend the, the rest of the quarter on. And um, um, we already touched upon different types of resonators in throughout the quarter because we use them as examples for strong coupling regime and weak coupling regime and so on. But now we will dive more into details of design and fabrication and, you know, which resonator you would look like to use for specific application. And you know this list here, uh, which is the layout of the the, the outline of the uh, chapter that uh, chapter six, I believe that uh, uh, Raul already posted, gives you all the different types of cavities that we'll cover up here. We'll not really spend much time on fabric resonators, which is kind of traditional atomic physics resonator. There is a little bit of text on that in the course reader, and also not much time on three dimensional photonic crystal resonators or plasmonic resonators because they're um, not you three-dimensional photonic crystal resonators are still under development and plasmonic ion cavities are not the central theme of this class but we will talk more about the ones that are in between uh, which are grouped into basically two categories uh, micro cavities employing only total internal reflection which is whispering gallery mode resonators and that's what we'll start today and micro cavities employing distributed bright reflection combined with total internal reflection which is one or to the photonic crystal cavities. And that includes micropillars and nanobeam cavities and two-dimensional photonic crystals and so on. So um, this picture here, which is very much out of, uh, um, out of date in terms of the Q factors and mode volume since uh, it was from a while back, 17 years ago, written by Kerry Vahala, um, I mean, still gives you a, an outline of how we organize and uh, group different types of resonators. And it still tells you which ones are the highest Q and the smallest volume, although, you know, numbers are out of date for, for most of them, except for these whispering gallery mode resonators here. So I will go back to it and use it often when we're going about different categories of resonators, because that is still valid, but don't trust these numbers because they're, they've been improved for a lot of these resonators since, since then. But the point is, photonic, there are different types of resonators, whispering gallery resonators that we'll be discussing starting with today, localized light only by total internal reflection, which is why they have these uh, circular, cylindrical, toroidal, spherical geometries, uh, so that you can kind of achieve the stable resonant mode based only on total internal reflection. And these resonators are still the record Q factor resonators. I mean, they have Qs even in the range of billions. Uh, and this is because they're also very large and they don't rely on microfabrication methods, but they also rely on, on uh, some additional surface treatments, um, melting of the material treatment with, with the laser and so on to achieve ultra smooth surfaces, right? So these 10 billions or so is still pretty much the record value for, for optical resonators. Um, and then the resonators that combine uh, distributed Bragg reflection and total internal reflection have smaller mode volumes, 
much smaller than these ultra high Q resonators. And they can have high Q factors, values are much larger than the ones you see here. They're maybe on the order of millions or so. Uh, but their strength is not really in the high, Q, high ultra high Q factor. Their strength is in the fact that you can achieve high Q factors simultaneously with a very small mod volume, which means that you would use them in very different applications. So if you have an application where uh, effects in the system scale as a function of Q factor square to mode volume, uh, and those effects would include a lot of nonlinear optical effects, and we'll see that in a couple of classes, we'll talk about uh, effect of resonators on Raman, stimulated Raman scattering. If you have effects like nonlinear optical effects, then where thresholds depend on Q factor squared to mode volume, uh, as opposed to Purcell effect, where it depends as Q factor over mode volume. You know, it's clear that for some nonlinear optics effects, you care about Q factor more than you care about the mode volume. So you may want to use ultra high Q factor and not such a small mod, mode volume. But if you want to build strong coupling regime, you know, or if you want to, you only care about the Purcell factor where you have Q factor to mode volume. And at the same time, you also care about modulating the system, turning it on and off then you'd rather use these very small volume cavities where you can actually achieve also pretty good Q factor and you will see much stronger effects. So the, the bottom line is this chart is not a competition. I mean, all of these resonators have very important roles in different applications, uh, but you don't want to pick one resonator and use it for all the applications. There are clearly applications where ultra high Q resonators win and that includes biosensing, uh, nonlinear optics, you know, in various nonlinear optical effects. And then there are applications where, you know, moderate Q and ultra small volume resonators win, which is cavity QED, right? Uh, definitely, and Purcell enhancement or lasing threshold reduction. So we'll start with whispering gallery resonators, and we'll, you know, they're kind of grouped into high Q and ultra high Q, right? And high Q are the ones that are defined in planar geometry on chip and they're made by lithography and dry etching typically. And ultra high Q are the ones here that are defined by melting of silica, right? So those are the largest volume ones that have the smoothest surfaces and highest Q factors. And all, all of them have some spherical, cylindrical geometry and so on. Uh, modes are very similar in all of these resonators. So we'll start with these ones here, um, just because cylindrical geometry is easier to analyze than spherical geometry. And then we'll talk about the other ones later on. So, so today we'll, uh, you know, in the next 10 minutes or so, we'll just start with very simple introduction to whispering gallery mode resonators. And uh, next, maybe set up the equation that we'll solve next time on Thursday, which you can use to plot whispering gallery resonators in the system. And what we'll do in a class is a very simple model that works for uh, kind of larger diameter resonators. So equations that we'll derive here and analytical solutions still hold and you can use them to calculate mode volume, to calculate you know, overlap between the field and active medium. Uh, they will not really give you accurate estimates on the Q factor, okay? Uh, so if you're interested in really finding exactly Q factor of the system or solving resonators that have, you know, smaller diameters, you will have to use numerical methods. And we'll discuss that later at the end of the quarter, but now I'll give you analytical tools um, that are pretty good. In most, many cases, you can still use them to, to solve the problem quickly. So, so the reason why these modes are, uh, these resonators are called whispering gallery resonators is because of, um, the paper by Lord Rayleigh, uh, which is called, uh, where he studied sound waves in St. Paul's Cathedral in London, which has this uh, cylindrical gallery. And he noticed that when people stand on this gallery, they can hear whispering sound made by someone on the other end of the gallery, which was kind of counterintuitive because the cathedral is very large. So how do you hear someone whisper on the other end of the cathedral? And he was curious about that problem. And he solved for the wave equation for sound waves inside of the cylindrical uh, dome and found that there are these modes that he called named whispering gallery modes because that's what he was solving, whispering uh, gallery problem. And he found that there are these modes of sound that technically kind of like established these standing waves next to the walls of the cathedral of the cylindrical shape. And of course, this is for the modes of sound, but 
you know, uh, for wave equation for electromagnetic waves, there are likewise these whispering gallery modes that are also localized next to the interface between high and low index material. So for kind of historical reasons, since mathematics of the problem is the same, we also call them whispering gallery modes, although they're whispering gallery electromagnetic modes. And this here is for electromagnetic mode, but it will be similar for, for sound waves. Um, and, you know, these types of resonators have been used in many applications today. I mean, people use them for lasers, uh, use them for modulators. They can be in a variety of geometries, disks, rings, toroids, spheres. I mean, it's all pretty much the same. They can be made in, in a variety of materials, active materials, such as in new phosphide, gallium, arsenide for lasers, uh, silicon for modulators or for, for filters. There are also workhorse platform for uh, uh, wavelength division, multiplexing, demultiplexing systems based on resonators. We'll talk about that later uh, in silicon platform. Uh, and for making, pre making them pretty much in any um, of these materials, you would have to follow a fabrication method that is outlined here. Of course, you don't really do fabricate ever a single resonator one at a time. You fabricate many of them on the chip, but this is just illustrating how you would do it. Uh, they're planar, what we would call planar geometry resonators. And here I'm talking about micro disks and micro rings. We'll talk about microspheres and micro toroids later. So you start from your planar geometry. This could be silicon on insulator or gallium arsenide on insulator. You do some electron beam lithography where you define the pattern where these disks would be or rings would be. Um, and you can do um, maybe remove the rings or, or, or um, if you are making uh, micro disks, remove the circles or disks where they would be. I mean, there are various ways of doing this mask deposition. So we will not really go into details, but the bottom line is that you have to end up with, if you're making micro disks, with this array of disks of something that would protect your material underneath when you're doing etching. And here, the process was lithography and liftoff, metal liftoff, but could be just photoresist deposition. So if you have this array of disks, uh, then you can actually use it as a mask for etching. You transfer the pattern through your top layer, planar layer, where your resonators would be. Um, and then you have to add up with the pedestal. If you're making micro disks, then they have to have a pedestal. If you're making rings, then you would actually just leave the oxide layer underneath. Uh, but for micro disks, you have to have that etching step. Uh, or if you're using silicon, then you use something like xenon defluoride. It could also be a gas etching to remove part of the material underneath, but not completely because you still need the pedestal that would support your disk. And the reason why you need the pedestal is for mechanical reason, but also you want that pedestal to be away from the edges of this disk because that's where you would be exciting whispering gallery modes. And of course you remove metallic mask from top from at the very end, otherwise it would be lost. So um, before we write the equation that you have to solve for whispering gallery resonators, I just wanted to briefly remind you of the, uh, of the, the total internal reflection that we did in chapter two and uh, total internal reflection occurs at the interface between two materials that have refractive index contrast. And for a wave incident from the high index material with an angle greater than the critical angle, which is equal to the angle with whose sign is the ratio of these two refractive indices, right? Um, you will have total internal reflection and in the regime of total internal reflection field in the second medium, which has low index is not zero, but it has evanescently uh, immanescent decay away from the interface with penetration depth that depends on the refractive indices and wavelength and, and angle of incidence. So that's all what we need, did in chapter two. And the point here is that the larger the angle of incidence you have, you will have a smaller penetration depth, right? In this ray picture that we analyze that. So I'm reviewing this because we'll start with kind of geometrical optics argument for these spring gallery resonators to introduce something called azimuthal numbers, and then we'll solve actual wave equation. 
And uh, let's assume for a moment that you have a very large resonator. So this re geometrical optics argument holds and you have some, some cylinder or you have some in two dimensional world, some, some circle of high index material with refractive index N1 surrounded by refractive index material uh, of material equal to N2, and you launch a ray at some angle that is greater than critical angle for total internal reflection, right? That ray would bounce from the interface, as you see here, and it would bounce again and again and again and again. And for the right choice of this incident angle, you can close a polygon, okay? So let's assume that you have a polygon that has two M sides, you know, and we'll see why that is important to have it exactly B2M once we solve the problem uh, using the wave equation. But for now, I'm just telling you, you have a 2M sided polygon, which is closed here, and you have kind of a stable orbit that the wave produces here in the stable mode that it produces. Uh, so if you have a 2M sided polygon, um, it, this 2M sided polygon would consist of 2M triangles, uh, and these triangles um, can be actually uh, have this central angle equal to 2 pi divided by 2M. So from very simple geometry, you can find that this angle of incidence relative to the normal, which is one of the angles in this um, triangle, would be equal to pi half times M minus 1 divided by M. So the larger the side, number of sides of the polygon, uh, the larger the angle of incidence, right? So this is very, very simple math. And if this is the angle of incidence, which you found from this simple geometry argument, theta i, right? Um, clearly, if you increase the number of bounces that the wave makes, you know that the angle of incidence would be larger. And from the review that we had on the previous slide, you know that the penetration depth into the second medium would be small which is what we proved when we looked at total internal reflection before. So this is the penetration depth into the second medium. So, so why am I repeating this whole story, right? So if you have a mode that has very large number M, and we call M azimutal number of the wave, okay? And that corresponds to the number of bounces that the mode would make around this cylindrical uh, edge. For a very large M, you will have very small penetration depth into the second medium, just because the incident angle would be very large, right? We know that that would be the case for total internal reflection, which means that you can make a whispering gallery mode approximation in the regime of very large M, meaning that you can neglect the field into the second medium and assume that field is basically zero in the medium with refractive index N2. I'm making this approximation so that I can solve the problem easier. Of course, this is inaccurate, right? I know that there is always a field in the, the second medium, right? The only thing that changes is how deeply that wave penetrates the second medium. But making it zero will make the problem solution easier, right? And I can at least obtain accurately the field solution inside of the first medium analytically. I know that this argument is inaccurate because there is always an evanescent tail into the second medium. And this is how we use to excite majority of these resonators by evanescent coupling from a fiber or another resonator or a wave cut. Okay. But for analytical solution, you know, I will make whispering gallery mode approximation, meaning that I neglect the field outside, only I'm looking field inside. And this will give you accurate solution for field inside of the resonator. So if you're interested in designing a laser or you only design or cavity QED system and you care about the field inside, you will obtain accurately frequency and field profile and so on. But of course, you neglect the field outside. OK, so whispering gallery mode approximation holds in the regime of large M, large azimuthal number. You can neglect the field outside. The other approximation uh, that we will ma make in order to solve the problem analytically is effective index approximation. And you may have heard about effective index before. Effective index approximation allows you to reduce the dimensionality on the problem. So if I'm interested in solving a micro disk and likewise micro ring, but here I'm solving a micro disk, it's a three dimensional system with certain refractive index radius thickness surrounded by some refractive index and not. You can solve this, but you would have to solve three-dimensional problem. Of course, you can solve it numerically um, and in some cases analytically, uh, 
But if you were to solve it analytically, it would be very difficult because you have to actually write your boundary conditions and all of these different surfaces, even if you apply this spring gallery mode approximation. There are interfaces on top and on bottom. So instead of solving three-dimensional problem, three-dimensional wave equation, we will use effective index approximation and reduce this to a two-dimensional problem. And people use effective index approximation for other problems as well, where they uh, would like to basically reduce three-dimensional problem to two-dimensional problem. So how do you introduce effective index approximation? Effective index approximation means that I'm replacing this disk with cylinder, which is infinite in the Z direction. Okay, it has the same diameter. It is surrounded by the same refractive index and not, uh, but something will have to change. And what changes is refractive index. Instead of having a disk of thickness D, with refractive index ND, I will have an infinite cylinder with effective index and F. So if you look at the field, which was kind of localized in this planar slab in a disk and which had some tails that decayed into surrounding region, I will replace that with something that has uniform wave fronts inside of the infinite cylinder, right? And from the argument that ND is larger than N naught, if I average out that index with some effective index and, and completely flat wave fronts, N effective will have to be between N naught and N D. And I'll show you how you would find it. So two approximations to solve it analytically, whispering gallery mode approximation, meaning in the regime of large azimuthal number, you neglect electric field outside of the disk and effective index approximation, which lets you replace this finite thickness disk with infinite cylinder by changing, substituting it with refractive index equal to an effective. So how do you find effective index, right? Um, effective index for this, well, the value of effective index depends on the geometry and also depends on the mode for which you're calculating effective index. So let's say if you're interested in the lowest order mode, which would have electric field profile in the vertical direction within this slab given by this um, envelope, right? And that's generally the mode that we would be interested in because it's the fundamental mode with the maximum electric field inside of the center of the slab. If by introducing effective index approximation, we will replace this with um, a mode which would have the same uh, propagation um, factor. Um, this is actually uh, phase velocity inside of this uniform medium with effective index and effective, right? So it would have for the same wavelength, the same propagation constant, right? The same dispersion, except that here inside of this uniform medium in the Z direction, it would be basically a plane wave. So if you look at this, right? Just this relation, if you look at an actual solution for waveguide modes, slab waveguide modes in the three-dimensional system, you will find some, some propagation constant corresponding to that specific frequency, right, in that, in, in that system. But here we would like to uh, have the system where uh, for infinite wave fronts in the Z direction, I actually have exactly the same kind of propagation constant K vector for that given frequency, but I know that I have to replace the refractive index with some effective refractive index. And in this uniform medium, K vector or propagation constant can be calculated as two pi over lambda, where lambda is the free space wavelength, times effective index, right? In this particular case, uh, for the system on the left, you would have to calculate dispersion of this slab waveguide in order to find the combination of K vector or you know, written as beta here. It's different from beta that we had for laser. This is just the propagation constant for a waveguide mode, which would correspond to a specific lambda or frequency for which we're trying to match effective index, okay? So that's the, the bottom line. I mean, this is not really telling, giving you exact value of effective index, but that's what you're trying to do, right? So when you're replacing some system with effective index approximation, you start with your slab waveguide, you calculate slab waveguide modes, and just then try to replace those slab waveguide modes with the plane waves in the medium that has a uniform refractive index in the vertical direction, but it would have some effective index that is between the index of the core and cladding of the waveguide so that you know you match the frequencies for the same propagation vector. And you can see that this mode penetrates low index material 
as well as it being concentrated in the high index material. And it also tells you that depending on the envelope of this mode, you will have different effective index. I mean, you may have, if you have a mode that has multiple lobes in the central region, if we have a different overlap with the surrounding region, if we have different dispersion relation, which means that the effective index would be different, right? But for the first order slab waveguide mode, um, which we're looking here, and that's the profile that we are also primarily interested in in microdisc resonators, you can find effective index from this formula, right? So this is just derived specifically for this, this mode. And this formula tells you how you can find the effective index as this um, averaged sum of the index of the center of the waveguide, core of the waveguide, and cladding. So NG is the slab, NC is the cladding, which in many cases is just air, but it could be something else like index deposited on top and bottom. So effective index is this weighted sum of the two indices. B is the weighting factor. Uh, B is the field confinement factor which you can calculate as shown here, um, depends on parameter V and parameter V you calculate also from the dispersion of the mode. It depends on the wavelength. It depends on uh, difference between refractive indices and thickness of the slab. And obviously from, from this, it's related to the discussion that we just had. V is the confinement factor, right? For the slab mode, tells you how well it's confined and it would be more confined if you have a larger index contrast and you know larger thickness of the slab. And from that, you can find this weighting factor that you plug in and effective index would always be between refractive index of the core and the cladding, right? Depending on how well the mode is confined. Okay, so if you, for example, take a semiconductor micro disc, oh, are we, oh, I'm so sorry. I think we are very, very uh, delayed now. So I, I'll stop now. I think we're nine minutes over time. You should have warned me. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> I didn't pay attention. So we'll stop here and then next time we'll resume from here and solve, solve the problem. Sorry for holding you on too long. I didn't intend to, I just carried on. Thank you. See you on Thursday. We'll wrap up sooner on Thursday to make up for nine minutes. Okay, bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.